All right, what's good everyone? Peter here, aka StudyMate, back with my third video, uh, but we're, we're gonna call this two and a half because I'm really just wrapping up on the content from my last video. If you haven't seen that, check that out here on the tournament data. Now we covered in the last video how to actually download the data using either the Numer API or manually straight from the Numerai dashboard. And in today's video, we're gonna check out how to actually do a little bit of basic analysis on the data, take a look at what it looks like, look at some of the features, the eras, and how exactly it's structured so that in our next video, we can look at how to put it and use it to train our machine learning model. So thanks for tuning in and let's jump into it. All right, so in our last video, we left off on where we downloaded the data from the Numer API and from the Numerite website straight off the dashboard. Now, where we picked up, now that we actually have all the files that we need, we can go ahead and read it into a data frame. Now, for those who are still a bit new to pandas or Dask, a data frame is just the structure that we're gonna actually put our raw data into to be able to uh, have a bunch of methods that are gonna help with the transformation, manipulation, and using actual usage of the data uh, rather than you know from its raw format. Now, again, Another little reminder, I'm using Dask because I have a very mediocre setup and I'm poor, but if you have a good computer with a lot of, you know, a GPU and a lot of RAM, then you should probably be okay maybe just to use Pandas or if you have a cloud service that maybe you're using, I'm looking into that as well, um, a couple options. But, you know, if you have enough uh, actual computing power to work with the data as is using Pandas, go ahead and do that. If you need a little help with, from a software perspective with Dask, go ahead and do that. Whatever floats your boat, really, whatever, whatever works. We don't really care about being fancy. We're just trying to get it done. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and use, uh, I'm gonna make a new variable rather to store the data. And this is gonna be called my DF underscore train variable. I'm just gonna hold all of the training data. And for this, I'm going to refer back to my DD variable. Again, this is just what I imported Dask, my Dask data frame as. And from my data frame, there is a read underscore parquet method. And this method takes a string. Now this string is going to be the path to the file we want to uh, read. And for us, if we remember back to the last video, we stored and downloaded our data into a data folder. So we can go ahead and put that there. And the name, we kept the same name from the Numer API. So that was Numeri underscore tournament, sorry, training rather, underscore data underscore int eight dot parquet. If we go ahead and run this, boom, no error, which is a good sign. And what we can do is, you know, replicate the exact same thing for our validation data. Now I'm lazy, so I'm going to copy paste, but all we're going to change is everything from train. We're just gonna make this, you know, val or validation. So I've gone ahead and changed the name of the variable to df underscore val. And then down here, we're gonna do the same for, from uh, change from training to validation. Boom, good to go. Now we're also gonna have to make a variable for the tournament data, but that one's gonna be a little bit different. So we're not gonna copy paste for this, but we're gonna say that our df, and we're gonna call this tournament, is equal to, again, uh, dd.read parquet, but for the path here, if we remember back to the last video, we were a little bit different with the path. We actually had a separate variable. So I'm gonna make this an F string. Um, and we we made a, a subfolder for the current round. So we're gonna have to make sure to include that here. And then we can just put numeri underscore tournament underscore data underscore, so many underscores, underscore into eight dot Parquet, okay, good. Run this, no error. So that just means that Dask was able to find the file that we're talking about and now we're good to go. 
I'm gonna go ahead and queue up a uh, the dot head method for each of these. Now, dot head again for those are maybe a bit new on uh, Dask or pandas. Dot head just gives me the first five rows of my data frame. So we're just gonna use this to take a peek at the data, check out what's going on, and maybe chat about that for a little bit. So I'm gonna make sure to queue all of these up and maybe do a quick cut here. So see you in a second. Okay, now that these are all done, we can go ahead and take a look at the training data to start. So this is what the data, data frame actually looks like. So as you can see, our index is the ID. So it's just a unique ID for every uh, row of the data set. And then we have a column for the era. Now, again, in the numeri data set, there is no actual date uh, column that we can work with. So we're not gonna be doing any like time series analysis to start. But we do have the era, which just tells us uh, they, they use a era for every week. So we do have some idea of the timeline of the data or where exactly our data is from, but not an exact like, you know, January 2016 or whatever like that. We also have a data type column for whether here, as we saw from the training set. So it tells us which type of data it is. So we have our train here. And then for all of our features, as you can see, they're just randomly generated names. I think they have a hashing function to, to create the names, um, and as well as the data in those feature columns are all, so the feature names are anonymous. Again, we don't really know what, what any of these really mean in the real world. Uh, it's just random data. And we also have uh, the data in those random columns are all integers. Uh, again, we, we made sure to uh, highlight that because this really helps with the you know amount of memory needed to process the data. So very important that all of the features are integers. And if we keep scrolling to the right here, what we'll see is we have a lot of targets. Now this is new uh, as of I think last month now or two months, uh, two months now. We have 20 targets to use. Now uh, I believe that the 20 are 20 day targets and 60 is 60 day targets. And again, we aren't obligated and aren't scored on all of these targets. We're only scored on the final target, which funny enough isn't actually showed here, but it's just called target. It's just it's just the one. It doesn't have all the the names and, and days associated with it. It's just the final target. But you know, we'll go into a little bit more detail about these additional targets uh, in a little bit. But as you can see, we have all the values for them because this is the training set. And if we take a look at the validation, very similar. As you can see, though, the eras are quite a bit later on. So the validation is definitely later in the data set. And we have the data type is different. But other than that, everything is pretty similar in the validation set. And then lastly, with the tournament data, now this is somewhere, I think we had 857 here, somewhere in between for the tournament data. But as you'll notice, we do not have any of the targets and that's because that's what we're gonna have to predict once we've trained on the train and use the validation as well. That's what we're gonna now go to the tournament data and you know predict on. Now I wanna take a minute to chat a little bit more about the actual features and maybe explain that a little bit more from the, the kind of way I took it when I first saw them. And I'm a soccer player, so the first analogy I went to is, is training for soccer. And my understanding of them and from what I've seen in some of the forums so far, I've seen some people just completely ignore them, which makes sense uh, just to get started is and just kind of fill them with some random value. But the actual idea behind them, what well, I believe, and from what I've seen on the forums a little bit, is that, you know, what we're trying to do with the adjacent features, we'll call them, is that we can use them to try to understand how well we're going to perform on our final target without directly, you know, it being that exact final target. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, my, from my analogy that I have here is, you know, with soccer, we can try to estimate how well a player is going to perform in a you know real target or a real life soccer game by trying them on these adjacent you know targets which would be like a smaller soccer net or how well they can dribble through cones etc how athletic they are 
you know, we can use these adjacent, not exactly one-to-one, -one, but similar targets to try and, again, estimate or get an indication for how well they're going to perform in the real life scenario, which is the, you know, real life soccer game. So that's kind of how I see these targets being used. I think it just gives additional context rather than optimizing for one single, uh, pr you know, target and being all in from that one lens and just gives us different variety of ways to test our models before putting them out into the real world. All right, now that we've gone over the targets a little bit, we can now move on to actually breaking down the data, going over some of the features, the eras, and the overall structure of the training data. Now I'm gonna be comparing the training data versus what I'm gonna be calling like a more traditional machine learning structure. Um, it's very similar to what you've worked with if you've done a Kaggle competition, but we'll get in the weeds in that in just a second. First off, what we're gonna to wanna to do is section out the feature data away from the target data. And the way we're gonna to wanna to do that is by making a variable called, I'm gonna call it features. And what features is going to hold is just a list of all of the column names that are feature columns. So the way that we can do that with list comprehension is by looking at every column name and just looking at if it starts with feature, because what we saw earlier in the data set was that the structure is it's called feature underscore and then those randomly generated words. So what we're gonna look at, C for C in our DF underscore train, and then if we're gonna use this string method starts with, and then again, we're looking for feature. If it starts with feature, then we know it's a feature column. And that's it. So now we can go ahead and just do a quick print statement to make sure we're getting the right data in our list. And boom, now we have all of the feature column names in this features variable. And that's gonna help us later on to be able to just get all of the feature data. Now we're gonna wanna do the same for the targets. So I can, I'm gonna go ahead and just do the exact same thing with a variable named targets now. And we're gonna go ahead and just switch up one small thing with the starts with method. And that's where, that is that we're going to be looking for target instead of feature uh, for the value that we're checking if it starts with. Pretty straightforward. We can go ahead and run this now. And if we do another print now for our targets variable, uh, everything up here is gonna be the same, but when we scroll all the way down, we'll see a second list now with all of the uh, targets that we saw earlier as well as the one that we actually couldn't see earlier, which is the most important target. It's the, the one that's just called target. No extra uh, name or day indicator. This is just the final target that we're actually going to be scored on. So it's the most important, but it's there, it's there. We didn't see it earlier, but it's there, I promise. So now that we've done this, we're actually not done yet. We're gonna do a few more changes. One of them is going to be adding a column to our data frame, and that is going to be called, so I'm gonna call it the error no. So this is just, it's just short for the error number. And the reason we're gonna to wanna to make this column, I'm gonna scroll up for just a second, is because as we can see in our error column, the values in here aren't actually integers, even though it's, you know, we're seeing 575. The giveaway here is that this leading zero is really telling us, hey, that's not an integer or a float. This leading zero here is telling me that this is stored as a string. And because of that, it's going to make it a bit harder to work with going forward. So we're going to want to just add a new column that's just going to store this exact same data, but as an actual integer. So what we're gonna do back down here is we're going to say we want the same exact values in our error column. So I'm just going to do df underscore train dot error, and then I'm going to apply this as type method, and I'm going to tell the as type method that I want all of those values just as an integer. So I'm gonna pass in this int here. And that's it. Now. We should have a new column in our DF train called Arano. 
And what we're going to actually also do is take those values now and store them in a separate variable. And I'm just going to call that eras. And this is just this is going to be another helpful variable to have going forward, just so that we can actually have all of the error values uh, that, that we know we're going to be working with. So I can have this just be df underscore train dot error no. And boom, we run this no errors. So we're probably doing okay. And the last little check I'm going to do is I'm going to print out the errors dot max because I want to see what the max error is in our training data set. Uh, in our, our sorry, df underscore train data frame, just as like a, a check to make sure everything lo got loaded in properly. But because I'm using Dask, I need to add an extra method here with dot compute. And what that does is because Dask is used for a lot of big data applications, um, if you just do dot max, it's going to kind of lay out the function, but it's not actually going to execute it until you add on this dot compute uh, method, just to really be sure like, hey, are you sure you, you know, this could be a really long or big, are you really sure you want to do this right now? So that's kind of what dot compute is, is done from what I've understood. And so that's why when I run this it takes a little bit longer because uh, we're working with a lot of data here. And again, I've got a very ghetto setup, so I'm doing my best, but I'm going to do a quick cut here and uh, I'll see you in just a second. All right, now that that's wrapped up, we can continue on and review a little bit about what we've covered already, a little bit about features. Now, what we said earlier, there's 1,050 randomly named features. Now, one thing we didn't talk about was the feature groups. Now, this is something that in the old data set came, I think there were six groupings of all of the different features that they were assigned. I think they were called intelligence, wisdom, strength, et cetera, et cetera. Now in the new data, that is no longer there. So there are groupings in the data. However, it's a little bit more up to us to decide what they are. And that's something that we can kind of strategize around. I have some code here. And what this does is it essentially just takes all of the data, all the feature data from just the first era. So as you can see here, we're just checking to see if the error number is equal to one. And it's calculating the correlation matrix for every single feature just for that first era. And what you end up with is this matrix here. So as you can see, there are some clear patterns in the data and in the features and how they relate to each other because there's, you know, a very clear pattern to some squares and these lines that draw across. But what exactly those are named or how you would exactly go ahead and, and group those together is not, there's no name to them. And that's kind of, again, for us to decide and for us to kind of play around with and strategize around. Great, so now that we understand a little bit more about how the features interact with each other, let's move on to eras. Now, the biggest change with eras coming from the old data set is that now they are numbered by week, where previously they used to exclusively be numbered by month. Now, as you can see in the image here, there's a significant amount of overlap between consecutive eras. So if you look at the uh, differences between one and two, there is a large portion here that are overlapping. But with eras one and five, as you can see, there's no overlap at all. So knowing that there's actually a way to still roll up to the monthly level by sampling every fourth era. So if we went era one, era five, era nine, and so on, there would be no overlap at all between our eras in that sense. And we're gonna get a little bit more in detail with exactly how to do that in our next video around modeling, because that's gonna be important as we start to feed this data to our models that we're training. But for today, just wanted to outline the differences with respect to the old data set because it's good to understand the structure of the eras now that they've changed. Just on this last point, although we are given the era, I wouldn't jump on time series approaches as your first, if you are still working on your first attempt. Don't get me wrong, if you do wanna try it eventually, it's just that 
because we don't have the exact date, it, it seems to be something that is a little bit more successful with uh, numerized signals, which again, I'll be making a video on soon enough, but we'll get into that once we get there. Cool. So now that we understand a little bit more about the error structure, we can get into the data structure of the training data. So first off, we're going to be looking at, again, I'm going to be calling this the traditional, more Kaggle, if you've ever done one of those, data structure here, where you have your full data set, you make a training data split, your test data split, and then from there you make another split for the training data for the training set and the validation set. Now the training set is what you're essentially feeding to your model to fit it so that it can learn all of the relationships in the data, so on. Now from there, you might have many models. So that's where you use the validation set to either choose for like model selection, or if you know what type of model you want, this is where you would tune your model hyperparameters. From there, you have, you know, one model that you like, it's tuned, it's ready to go. And that's where we use the test data to act as like a final test of data that it hasn't seen before to really make sure that the model will, you know, really perform well out of sample, you know, hasn't seen it before. So there's no biases to worry about. So that's where you would use the test data as your, you know, final test. And that's when you would move on to your live data where, you know, that's the real deal and you hopefully do well in, in the real world. Or again, if we're going back to our Kaggle analogy, this is like the hidden data set that you would be scored on the leaderboard. Okay, so now that we understand, you know, the more traditional stuff, again, if you've done a course on this, maybe in uni or, or on Udemy or something, this is like the, the your bread and butter. But the only difference is when we move over to the numeri terms, there's a little bit of confusion because we're using the same terms, but how we actually use them pragmatically is a little bit different. So again, just before I move on, I, I have these labels here to really color scheme how we're using the data realistically. Um, and, and you're gonna see that there's a little bit of change with how these colors match up with the names of the data sets. And it's a bit confusing, and I was confused by it when I first joined, but you'll see what I mean <laughs> as we get into it. So what I have here in this in this text here is just copy paste straight out of the documentation, which I actually do throughout these notebooks. A lot of this, I use the docs as a point of reference and the example script. So I'll actually include that in the description and make sure you have that as a reference. It's definitely more whole or, or complete than what I have here. Just for reference, if we jump into the visual here, this is where I really want to draw that distinction because as you can see, we have not just train, test, and live as like before, we have the, and you'll recognize this is the same format that we downloaded the files in earlier where we have train, validation, and tournament. So though that's the first split from the first data, full data set. And now that second split for the training data is still the same. So we still are going to be making a training set and a validation set. Now I know you're very confused and you're saying, well, hold up, Peter. Why are we making a validation set when we're given a file that says validation data? And that's because, and this is where it gets a bit confusing. The way that we're going to be using the validation data that they give us is actually akin to the test set that we saw in our previous example. So as you can see, I have the validation data here in orange because this is what we're going to be using as like a final test before we take our model and apply it to the live eras. And that's different in, and so it's just a change in naming. And that's because also the test data from the tournament data is actually just used for internal testing. So it's not used for the final test before going to live. 
it is used just for internal testing. And we don't really know what Numera uses that for, which is fine, but it, this is what tripped me up when I first started. And it was a little bit confusing because I was like, wait, I have the test data, but it's not actually used like the test data I was used to. So we're still going to be making our training set and our validation set. And then once we've performed, just like before, our model selection and hyperparameter tuning, that's when we move on to the validation data as our final test of our model out of sample. You know, this is data it hasn't seen before to make sure it's working well. And then when it's working well, and we know it's good. That's when we move over to the test data and the live era from the tournament data. And we make our predictions. And these two are what we're going to be submitting on a weekly basis to Numeri. Okay, so it's important to understand this early on, because if not, then it'll be very confusing and, and figuring out the switch up of the names will, will kind of trip you up, just like I did, hopefully. So if there is any confusion, make sure to just refer back to this and, and just understand the flow. Really, that's the most important part is like, what's the, the flow of how you should be going from, you know, many models, trying out multiple models on your validation set, then from there, picking a, your favorite one or the best performing one, and then doing a final test on the validation data. And then if it were still doing well, that's when you're gonna be like, okay, I trust this model. It's not gonna burn all my numeraire. That's when we go to the live eras. There are a few extra, you know, tips and tricks that uh, are regarding like overfitting, but but again, we'll, we'll cover that in the next video all about modeling. Just wanted to really make sure we're, we're really clear on the terms before we, we get there, because if, if there's any confusion about the structure of the data before we even get to modeling, definitely a headache. And I just had this last picture here just to really highlight the timeline of the eras. I know we saw some of the eras earlier, exactly different ranges of error values from the three files we imported earlier. But I like this visual because it, it combines what we just covered with the structure of the training data, the tournament data, live data, validation data, along with the era kind of timeline. So definitely do take a look at this and really understand what's going on here, because this will also kind of help to understand the flow and where we're pulling our data from in these different parts. And that's about it. So again, thank you for watching. I really do hope that this is helping you come along with your model development and that hopefully you're close and a couple of videos away from staking and submitting a model of your own. Again, we got a couple videos left in this series. If this is something that you find beneficial or that you like, please like and subscribe and comment and let me know if there's anything I can do better. Always looking for feedback from the community on this series. So I look forward to hearing from you all. I'm going to be, again, pushing this to GitHub so that you have all of these notebooks to use. I'll also be posting the reference materials like the that I mentioned, like some of the documentation I use to kind of make these notebooks, as well as the example script is, is definitely very useful. Uh, and I, I used it a lot when I was getting started. And also my socials where I occasionally ship post and kind of make some meme related numeri content and, you know, I'll be there to, to uh, like all of your 99th percentile <laughs> round summaries. So find that here in this notebook. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one.